for being here. Um, I am Blake Cohn. I am the executive director of the National Network of Schools and Partnership. Uh, I'm familiar, most of your faces are familiar to me, but I am just so grateful if you are new to our organization or to, um, to any of our webinars. We are a nonprofit that is, um, over the last eight years works to help schools um, enhance, create, improve programs that allow kids to connect with their learning in school to the real world through community engagement, social impact, service learning programs, et cetera. Our goal is to help get them integrated into the curriculum. So it's a all, um, all student um, uh, event and that everybody has the sh same shared experiences. And since COVID-19 has happened, we've had a lot of conversations about how does this work, which is so, based in um, going off campus and in interacting with other people and being in places that are filled with other people. And what does that look like um, when we're in a pandemic? And how do we create opportunities for our students that honor the same outcomes that, they that we want for our kids, the social emotional benefits, the empathy, the compassion, the listening, the humility, the collaboration, how do we create those programs when we are looking at each other in gridded squares on Zoom? And it's a struggle and it's hard. And um, I have invited both Susan and Sarah here today to talk about what are the ways that we can um, look to repurpose what we already have going in school to create opportunities for our students? Um, if you were here, at the beginning, um, Susan and I were talking that it's it's very unlikely that any of us are taking large groups of students out into the community next year, regardless of what the hybrid on-campus distance learning um, system looks like. So how can we make sure that the programs that we think are essential for the growth of our students remain um, valued and intact and authentic? So. That being said, the um, I, I'm recording this and it'll be on our YouTube channel at the end of today, probably, and I will send it out to all of you along with any notes that we take and a registrant list. I'm going to try something new today and I'm going to ask if you all can figure out how to switch your names on your um, on your box, if you go to the upper right hand corner and the three dots and it says rename, I'd love to know your first name, your school, and your state. That way we can start connecting with each other um, and know who's here and where they're coming from. So I am from NNSP and I am in Virginia. So if you do that, I think that'll help us make connections. I'm sorry I haven't started that two months ago, but um, I, Three dots in the upper right hand corner on your computer. I'm not sure if you are on your phone. I'm not sure where the rename button is. If somebody knows and can respond to the chat, that would be great. Um, on your picture. Yes, thank you, Crystal. So um, without um, further introductions, Susan is here from Winchester Thurston. They run a robust program called City as Our Campus, and she is going to explain to us how they are envisioning what fall would look like and what thoughts they have about how they're going to um, keep their programs going in this weird learning system that we are entering. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, as always, put your questions in the chat. I'll moderate that. Um, and then we will hear from Sarah from Trinity, and then we'll have time for um, some breakouts and some questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Blake. Um, so like Blake said, I'm Susan Freudenberg. I'm the City as Our Campus Coordinator at the Winchester Thurston School in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We're a pre-K to 12 school of just over 700 students. Um, and now we are all living in a virtual world. Um, so City as Our Campus is need, probably needs a little bit of explanation, which is really the idea of using the city of Pittsburgh as an extension of our classroom. WT is landlocked on two, on one full city block. Um, and we have a, our upper school is a separate building that's just the building at the corner of the other street. 
Um, and so we are surrounded by museums and colleges and universities, as well as a ton of um, houses. So City as Our Campus started as an extension of the classroom to give back to the community and to use the community to um, work with our students. And so I coordinate this curricular program for our pre-K to 12, and I work with teachers as the extension of their classroom curriculum. So everything from our kindergarten partnership with the Children's Museum to our um, 11th and 12th grade urban research and design class, which focuses on a neighborhood in Pittsburgh to um, actually redevelop and uses active um, requests for proposals, um, sites that are in the community and the students actually in, interview the community members and figure out what the community needs. So I help with all of that. Um, that has looked very different virtually now. Um, obviously, we aren't taking field trips to the Carnegie Museum or to um, the Andy Warhol and things like that. And so um, I've been spending a lot of my time re-envisioning what that looks like for us currently and then also for the fall. Um, we don't know how we're going back to um, school yet, um, but we're assuming it's some sort of hybrid model where some of our students will be on campus, some won't maybe. Um, we, we just don't know. Um, it's so uncertain. We know that the universities, um, Pitt and CMU, um, are making decisions where I don't think students will be back until January, um, and that's what's been sort of the buzz around Pittsburgh. Um, but we're planning for sort of what, what do you do when there are no trips um, and no guests coming to school. So I've created these sort of virtual options where, um, so I have sort of a couple examples that I wanna share and then explain sort of what my summer is going to look like. So we do a program called WT Reads with our upper school. Um, every student in the past has picked a book to read and then we've had a discussion sometime in the fall during band book week. Um, but this year we are picking one book for all of our students and um, through a partnership with Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures, which is our premier literary um, partner in the city um, who bring all the authors. They have a 10 evening series where they bring 10 different authors each year um, to the school. So we are sponsoring one of those authors this year, Leila Leilami, who um, wrote The Other Americans a couple years ago, and then she has a new book that's coming out, of course not being published until the end of September. So we are going to be reading The Other Americans, and we will be using a local bookstore who will ship out all of those books to our upper school students and faculty. Um, and they will receive a little letter ahead of, an email ahead of time from us explaining what WT Reads is and then that they'll be getting the book. Um, and then over the course of the fall, whether it's in person or over Zoom, we will be having opportunities in classes to discuss the book. And then at the end of October, Leila Leilami will be coming to our school. Um, that's the plan if it all goes well. Um, if it doesn't, then the plan will be for her to do a virtual visit with the entire upper school, which is over 200 students, and, um, and then to do a writer's workshop with a couple of the English classes, if possible. Um, and then the evening event that she does, that the general public goes to, we would also have an opportunity for our families to be a part of. So it won't be necessarily the same as bringing an author to campus to share her love of writing and the writing experience um, and exposing students to a National Book Award finalist and amazing author, um, but it is sort of what we can do. Um, and then looking at another partnership we have with Attack Theater, which is a locally run theater company who works with our lower school students. Um, they've done everything from an admission event where they've come in and done a movement exercise with our uh, uh, prospective pre-kindergarten students and their parents and made them create amazing stories um, and dance routines to um, working with our middle school students at times to help them bridge sort of those social scenarios that don't always go so great. Um, so in working with them, they've created some ver um, asynchronous sort of recorded sessions that we can use with our students um, and also have come into our morning meetings 
um, the way our current uh, schedule is working in our lower school is that our teachers have a live morning meeting um, every day. It's different times for each grade, obviously. And then the students do a lot of asynchronous work. And then they also have um, live sessions with different specialists and different teachers. Um, and it varies each day. So attack theater, the potential for partnership in the fall will really be this idea of working with our students on the social emotional um, focus and having opportunities during morning meeting to provide opportunities for them to move and create stories. Um, and we're just gonna try to keep it going. They also share a lot of information like with the Pittsburgh Symphony and they've offered to do all of that for us. Um, and another is um, one of the greatest things I think about this has been the opportunity to engage our alum, our alum network and um, teach uh, former students who were, who are in California or even in Singapore now have the opportunity to jump into classes through Zoom. And so we're really going to be working on creating, or I'm gonna be working on um, really establishing this database of our alums who have offered their support and willingness to work with our students to see what we can do in the fall of them with them popping into a class just to even sort of audit the class but also to be an active participant if necessary or needed um, you know we have someone we have a former alum who works in disney animation and it'll be amazing to have him speak to our art classes which we haven't been able to do because he's in california and it never works and he comes home very infrequently. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, we also have some alums who are in the theater world in New York and now with Broadway being closed, we have an opportunity to offer them stipends to be able to work with our students and our performing arts classes um, to create uh, virtual plays and things like that. Um, and then the other piece that I have been working on is really creating an online resource, um, Google Doc, that's a living document that anytime I see anything, whether it's on Facebook or a friend sends an email or I get an email from an organization that I'm putting it in one place and the division directors have that. Um, and it has everything from virtual tours of museums, like we've all seen at the Guggenheim and MoMA, but also our local museums, as well as um, reading resources and art experiences and music and dance, um, as well as science and math. And so I'm just really trying to create this robust um, resource that, our, that the teachers don't have to go to multiple places to look. And so I have the name of the site, the website, and then a little brief description about what they can find and it's everything i mean we're all seeing this um everywhere that we look but it's just an opportunity for not only for teachers but also at, i'm hoping it will be shared with parents that they can use as a resource um, and then the other thing i've really been thinking about is the transportation piece which is we are fortunate to have vans um, at our school that fit up to nine people and so when we have I think we have five of them. So my hope is that we will be able to take small groups to do service projects in the fall when we hopefully get out of the yellow um, and figure out ways to have the students actually get places if possible. Um, but obviously we, our contracts with the busing companies that we use um, to do that will probably not ever look the same. Um, so it's a lot of up in the air, but I'm really just trying to re-envision what we're already doing. Um, we've had the Children's Museum with our kindergarten do virtual tours and actually go to our outdoor classroom at the school and take video and share it with our students. Um, but it is definitely looking a lot different. And I think it's just, I'm offering my support of the faculty in the ways that I can. So I don't know if there's any questions. It's a lot of talking at my screen, so. <laughs> Um, I see Denise Brown Allen has her hand up. Thank you so okay. much, Susan. No problem. Um, Denise, if you want to unmute yourself, if you have a question. That was an error. My oh. hand is not up. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to put your hand down. Okay. 
Oh, sorry, I muted myself. Okay, before we start taking questions, let's, um, Sarah is here, Sarah Benison from, Sarah, thank you for being here, from um, Trinity School in Manhattan. And she is the Director of Public Service at, um, at Trinity. And she is here to share with us how Trinity is looking at the fall and um, what their programming is going to look like. So welcome. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's nice to see some familiar faces here. Hey, Susan. Um, and a few others. So um, thank you so much for including me. And um, I thought I'd just start by talking a little bit about Trinity's public service program, um, which is quite unique, because everything that we've done, we've sort of pivoted to this remote um, situation. Um, has remained rooted in the kind of core guiding principles um, that have guided our work all along. Namely, we still put relationships first. Even though we are socially distant, relationships continue to guide all of the work that we're doing. Um, so Trinity School is a very old school. Um, it's right on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I know some of you here already know this, but um, it was founded in 1709 as a charity school as part of Trinity Church Wall Street. And when I came to Trinity five years ago, um, I was kind of tasked with this you know, mission to shift the culture <laughs> of the school from one that was kind of solely achievement oriented, I'm sure this sounds like a familiar narrative to many of you, um, to one where you know, teachers and students were starting to connect what they were doing in classes with you know, kind of real social impact work in the world. And when I came there, it was sort of an overgrown garden model where there were a lot of student initiatives. There was no sort of consistent or concise narrative about what service learning meant K to 12 at Trinity. Um, my PhD is in history and education. And so I um, you know, naturally was starting to think about this work in, from, through, a, through a historic lens. And given that Trinity is, is so old, I actually started reading the archival records of the heads of school at Trinity from 1709, kind of forward, not all of them, just some of them. Um, and it was very interesting because I saw a few themes emerge um, that were consistent over the course of that long history. And one was that every head of school from the beginning was, was talking about how can we get the best teachers and the best students and this idea of the conversation between student and teacher is still front and center in our mission statement and at the heart of our school. But the second was um, an, a question and even an emerging anxiety over time about how to connect what was happening within school walls with what was happening right outside the school. And there was a di distinct commitment to addressing urban poverty and inequality. And in today's language, really to think about educational access because as a charity school, Trinity was founded from the beginning to provide educational access for children in New York City who couldn't afford to go to school. So that really kind of shaped my thinking about how we developed our public service program. Instead of um, you know, thinking about how we could engage with projects all over the world, I decided that our focus should really be on the city and that we should really live deeply into this mission and that also solved for another kind of guiding principle that continues to be prominent for me, which is how can we create um, opportunities for kids to engage on a weekly basis with other people so that we can learn, our students can learn how to accompany someone. This idea of accompaniment has also been very powerful in our thinking. I'm sure it's familiar to many of you, um, but how can our kids on a weekly basis accompany others in our local community on whatever journey they're on. Um, and so essentially over the course of a couple of years, I created partnerships with 14 different organizations all within five blocks of Trinity. We call these our community circle partnerships. And I started piloting programs where students in our upper school could devote free periods to going to these places which were all within short distance and so that they could incorporate that work as a seamless part of their school day. So, and I've also been really informed by the history of social movements. It's, I've always thought of this as a grassroots, grassroots movement from the bottom up with students at the helm, of course, supported and kind of set up for success by adults behind the scenes. 
But essentially, we started with about 25 kids who were piloting, um, for example, right across the street from Trinity. Trinity is surrounded by public housing, by subsidized housing, NYCHA buildings, um, and there is a Head Start program right across the street. No one had ever walked across the street, really, um, but we started with kids um, partnering with teachers there, going to classrooms on a weekly basis. And long story short, what started with 25 kids now encompasses over half of our um, upper school who are working on a weekly basis in the community. Last year, we saw a 40% increase in this and we're seeing more and more um, student engagement. However, <laughs> now we're in a different situation, obviously. But I mention all that as context just to say that our first, my first phone calls when all this happened were, were to our community circle partners. Um, and I have been in almost daily conversations with those partners. Um, we, and this has continued to provide a framework and a focal point for our school community. Um, and it also allows me as the director of public service to be able to have very clear um, priorities, because as you know, we can't do everything. We're very concerned about meaningful social impact. And because all of these partnerships are really now strongly rooted in relationships, I know that when kids are writing letters to our elderly neighbors across the street um, and sending even we've set up some Amazon wish lists because we've had to stop our food donation program. I know exactly who's receiving those things. I know Miss Fox is getting them. I know she's distributing those um, items and letters to people in the building. So again, it's a very grassroots approach. Um, so we've been doing multiple things with our community circle partners, including, you know, that we, we work with several schools in the neighborhood and we've moved those tutoring, mentoring, buddy uh, partnerships to remote models um, in the cases where it works for our partners. Um, so we're currently engaged in two of those remote models and um, we are piloting another one with uh, kids from Head Start preschool program. Um, and then of course, being in New York City, the other focus that has actually shifted a little bit for us is that frontline medical workers have been really at the top of our list. And we already had a partnership with Mount Sinai Hospital through a program that we created, which is called our Language Ambassadors, where Trinity Advanced Language students um, went weekly to Mount Sinai to support non-English speaking patients and their families at Mount Sinai. Um, so we've kind of built on that and we're supporting uh, pediatric patients now who actually cannot receive as many visitors as they were able to through video messages and letter writing campaigns. We've partnered with about six different hospitals, but again, these are all through relationships. So I'm reaching out to medical frontline workers in our community, and um, I've been supporting a lot of actually student initiatives to send lunches, write letters of support. And the nice thing is because those are all relationship built, I'm able, to, uh, there's been a lot of reciprocity in terms of, I never expected that, you know, doctors who are working night and day would be sending emails and notes back to our kids, but actually they have. So the unintended consequences, you know, one of my students who's my advisee actually really wants to be a doctor. And I'd actually forgotten that when he was reaching out to the Lenox Hill cardiologists and pulmonologists. But when they wrote him back, it was this kind of, you know, also added thing for him to, you know, sort of get a, a lens on, on what, what was what's happening. Um, so I won't rattle on about the many things that we're doing. Um, I'm happy to share more. And the other thing I've realized, we, we already communicate. Um, I didn't anticipate when I took this job, the strong sort of um, public relations <laughs> component to it, um, except that, you know, I realized a few months in, a parent complained actually to the PA president and said, you know, what's going on there? Nothing's happening in, in service, community service at Trinity. And so then I realized, oh my gosh, so much is going on. I'm just not doing a good job of sharing it. So I've become sort of like unabashedly embracing, we have an Instagram, we have Facebook. I normally send monthly newsletters and I've been sending them every two weeks during this crisis because so much has been happening. So we're communicating a lot with people and we have on the Trinity website, a page that's being constantly updated as a kind of one-stop shop where people can go. Um, 
and we have another website. So I'm happy, reach out, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to share any of that material with you if you'd like to see. And I actually find that images tell a thousand words. So our newsletters are actually mostly pictures. My text is just a few sentences and it's mostly images of um, our kids in action. And then the other piece I just wanted to mention that I think has shifted um, a little bit during this time we already were working, Trinity has three divisions that are in close proximity. It's basically one building on 91st Street, but we, we struggle with um, connecting across divisions because our divisions operate quite autonomously and we adopted a new schedule and we've worked on various ways of creating community, especially being a city school that is kind of a commuter school. Um, we struggle with that even in, in regular time. But I think that now even more so, my work has shifted to think about ways that we can connect our own community because as I'm sure you're all experiencing, kids are feeling very isolated from each other even though they're seeing each other on Zoom. So just this week actually we piloted, it's the seniors uh, last week, so we piloted um, a program where seniors were um, meeting with lower schoolers on Zoom to read stories and these stories were chosen by the head of our lower school. So we gave them a very specific list and we actually downloaded Kindle versions of the story so that seniors could share the images on the screen and they are meeting with lower schoolers. And it's actually gone really well. Over half of the senior class signed up to do this. Um, so as we look forward, I'm actually gonna, uh, going to be creating some summer programming. Uh, and I'm, I think I'm going to include this because we're going to be doing a huge Trinity Reads initiative um, and we're going to incorporate this and I'm going to try and keep up our virtual buddy programs because now that all the summer programs are canceled also, I have a lot of families reaching out to me saying, what can my kids do this summer? So, you know, the work is changing daily, but my next on the next horizon is kind of like developing a narrative for a summer program of options that would be good for kids and really thinking longer term also as a hybrid model in the fall, how we can continue to build um, on these partnerships. So I, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. No, it's perfect. Yeah. It's um, great. I am going to well and changing the way we've done this in the past. I'm going to welcome um, questions if people want to put their hand up and then I will facilitate it. Susan and Sarah, thank you so much um, for sharing how you're thinking about how what this work looks like in the fall and um i just have a question to susan in that um while people put their hands up to ask questions is your relationships with your museums are those things that people could start to build i'm thinking i'm in dc and this, there's the smithsonian could you build those um across you know like do they have to be your neighbor to build those relationships no. I think that that it doesn't matter where they are. I mean, I'm looking at the potential of what museums in Ohio or Virginia or DC, we could still have opportunities. I think this is the Smithsonian actually is on my online resource list um, for our students because of that. We just happen to have a partnership with the Warhol already and the Carnegie Museum. So we're, like Sarah said, like we're using our current partners to see what we can offer our fam offer our students but i think that it really is that um everyone's reimagining what their work looks like so i'm assuming that you know that i could contact the guggenheim and see what options there are they're probably being inundated with that type of request but i really think it's you know sort of the sky's the limit is in terms of who you try to reach out to um i know we have i mean for example we have a parent who works at uber um which is like one of the research centers is here in Pittsburgh. And so we had planned for him to come, you know, to have students go to Uber, which isn't obviously going to ever happen at this point. Um, but I still am trying to work with him to figure out what that can look like virtually. And so it's just a matter of that. Um, you know, I say I have like a form email. It's like, hi, my name is Susan Freudenberg. I'm the city as our campus coordinator for Winchester Thurston. We're looking to do fill in the blank. Um, is there anyone at your organization who would be interested in helping or would you know someone who might be um, at somewhere else? And so that's really been the way I've built our network. That's great. Thank you. Laura Day from Hockaday, you're up. 
Hello. Um, that was really helpful. Thank you both so much. Um, and Sarah, that's it's so cool to hear all about what you're doing and it sounds amazing. And um, I just was interested, and this is a very quick question, but like with the Spanish language support at the hospitals, which I think is such a good idea, um, are you able to shift that at all now via Zoom or anything like that? Or is that program not happening based on the not being able to go to hospital? Yeah, so the kids can't go visit. They can't be at the hospital right now. Um, but just speaking to the, you know, of course, before the priority was always, you know, what can we develop in our curriculum um, in terms of service learning? And so that program, you know, I've, I've built a, um, a strong partnership with our modern language department. And so we have actually, now that we're creating these video messages and sending letters to kids in the pediatric hospital at Mount Sinai, um, for example, our, our Spanish, advanced Spanish teacher had his class work on those letters in Spanish. Um, and we actually support patients in Mandarin, Spanish, and um, there aren't as many French speakers for whatever reason, but we had done some French before. But um, so, so yeah, we're, I'm still working with the language department, but in a remote way. Thank you. Um, Melissa from Choke. Hey, everybody. Um, I have uh, a question and a request, <laughs> if you will. Um, one, my request is I would be curious to hear if folks are coming up against liability issues in terms of having kids do online service activities where you're kind of going into somebody else's home, whether that be partnering with school kiddos from a neighborhood school, that sort of thing. So um, I'm curious to hear about that. And um, my question, which of course has totally escaped me, um, but I think it was really, I was reading in the comments something about uh, somebody's concern about creating more and more extra work and just trying to think about, yes, how do we do our service work out in the world? Um, I mean, being at a boarding school, our students are spread all throughout the globe. So protocols vary greatly from country to country. Um, but I'm just be curious to hear, and perhaps this is something that answers could go into a document um, to be shared out. But what are some other online activities that schools are doing, um, which again is kind of connected to my question about liability issues and permissions, that sort of thing. Thank you. So we have, we, oh, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. Oh, sorry, Susan. Um, I was going to say, so our, our, um, in terms of the liability piece, um, they, our technology team and our lawyers requested that we use, um, Google, what is it called? Google meet or Google hangout rather than zoom, um, for those outside of school, um, partnerships. And that, that is tricky because like, for example, one of the schools that we're working with has already gotten used to using Zoom. So they don't want to have to switch to like teaching everyone just for this one thing. So it's a good question. And I'm in the process of trying to cull through that. But, um, but the question of liability hasn't come up with, with the, um, you know, cross divisional stuff within with Trinity, just with the outside partnerships. So we've turned a lot of our partnerships internal. So our first graders just made a um, surprise video for the senior class that will be shared at their virtual commencement. Um, and they would have done something with an external partner, but we couldn't make that work um, for their urban planning project that they had done. We sort of really focused, we had to reshift the, pro, the, the project to be more about community. And then the students realized that Winchester Thurston is our community. So what could we do for our students? We also record all of our sessions. Um, we have a eighth grade, a middle school club is working with reading stories to kindergartners. And so they do that over Zoom, but they're recording the session and there is a teacher moderating it um, to observe and keep it there. So like every um, thing that we're doing. So we're about to have our STEM symposium, which is usually our like quote unquote science fair night, um, where everyone in the upper school is showcasing the projects that they've been working on for the entire year from our research science and computer innovations courses. And we've created um, 
Zoom links that groups of students will be in, sort of like separate breakout rooms. And there will be an upper school STEM teacher in each breakout room to make sure that the outside partners who are coming in and people that we may not necessarily know um, that everything is, you know, you know, for lack of a better word, kosher and um, and up to par. Um, so that's really how we're handling all of that um, is really just having that faculty support and and recording everything. Awesome, thank you, um, Monique from Andover. Hi everyone. Um, my question was similar to what Melissa was asking um, in terms of. Um, just risk management really balking at the idea of any sort of live virtual tutoring or mentoring with um, community partners. Um, and if anyone has examples of waivers that they may have been, you know, they've been using, but the idea of having other people in students' spaces and students in other people's spaces um, was not something anyone was particularly excited about. Even in, when we have programming on and off campus during the school year, we're required to have a campus adult there the entire time. Um, and so I would just ask if anyone has examples of waivers or language that they used. Um, I'd appreciate seeing that. We have a waiver that we use um, when kids register for hand, like work during the regular school year. Um, when they register for what we call community circle work, their, their adults have to sign um, a waiver that basically releases, for, you know, it's not even specific. I, actually, I think it lists all of the potential things that kids could be doing and then it releases everything for the year. So I'm happy to pass that along. I don't know how relevant it will be with this remote situation, but it might provide some language. And it's been vetted by Trinity's lawyers and everything. Thank you. I'm just gonna jump in very quickly. And in the chat, I put Book Nook Learning. So we're launching and piloted online tutoring. We work with uh, 13 elementary schools near us. And so we have now 200 kids tutoring virtually and we're using the book nook platform it's free right now um and we we're going through the principles at the schools and there's waivers on both ends so parents are having to sign off that's our problem we have this like we have tons of our kids have signed and they're ready but on the other end it's taking a minute for the community liaisons and principals to like hustle the parents to sign up to get their kid on this. so that's our that's our delay but we have 150 of students out of that whole group who've signed up. So that's the work right now schools are doing for the summer and going into the summer, they're trying to get kids to sign these waivers and log on to this and um, to, to do BookNook. We use, we use BookNook just because it's, it's actually great. Um, it's a great platform. It's the guy who started um, Reading Partners. He broke off and did this. And um, so we're trying it um, and it's going well so far and the waivers have been helpful on both ends. So I just wanted to plug that. Um, I know it's a new system, so that's not ideal for some people, but you could, you could poke around and maybe find language from what they're doing. It, it sounds to me, and um, Kelly, I see your hand up, but uh, it sounds to me like if we're thinking about what we should be doing to prepare for the fall, um, waivers on both ends of any potential partnership would be a good place to, to start in getting that, that groundwork done when you send out re-enrollment or whatever, the, the documents you have that go home that families have to fill out, um, that that might be a, a, a good baseline um, to, to start. And it's sort of unromantic, but it might be practical in, in actually getting things off the ground. Kelly from SMART. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I, uh, I work at an after school college access program in California. Um, and I'm wondering if people are considering um, how much screen time all of the students are using, um, especially when it comes to being in school for who knows how long, um, if everything is virtual. And then in addition to like our programming, um, because it's in a kind of tied to Caitlin's comment in the chat box of adding on like additional activities and kind of overwhelming or overburdening students and or families. Um, so that's kind of a concern. I'm wondering if anyone has a solution. So we, um, 
we were really intentional in our schedule um, for division specific. So lower school has a very different schedule than our middle school students and our upper school students. So um, our middle school students start the day with advisory every day and then they go right into a class and then they have a 45 minute break where they are actually asked to like go outside, you know, do something, do not be on a screen. And then they have another class. Um, uh, which is an hour. I'm looking at my daughter's schedule, um, an hour. And then they have actually an hour and a half break um, in the middle of the day. And then they have a, their third class. Um, and then in our upper school, they only have two hours of actual screen time class. Um, and the rest is, you know, they have a lot more work that's expected of them off the screen because that was really our intention. Um, to have them not be on the computer all the time because they're already on their phones all the time. Um, and so that's how Winchester was handling it. Sorry, I keep muting myself. Um, excellent. I think what we're going to do, thank you both so much, Sarah and um, Susan, for sharing everything. Uh, we're going to go to my all-time favorite breakout rooms, and I'm going to ask that you talk about two questions, which are what we're talking about. What are ways that you yourself at your school are thinking about repurposing your programs for the fall, and what tools, like the um, book nook, what tools have you found helpful and um, share them. I, I didn't create a shared document for this. So if somebody could take notes and, and send it to me, I would appreciate it. Um, so on that note, here are the questions. Oops, no question mark. And then I'm going to put you all in um, smaller um, breakout rooms. And then we will come back with like five minutes left to just wrap it up. But thank you both so much for sharing and everybody for your questions. And um, I will see you all in a minute. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, I'm aware of the time. It is almost one. I want to say thank you again to Susan and to Sarah for sharing their thoughts and for everybody and Courtney because she brought her baby again. Um, she gives me, um, I look forward to Thursdays for all of you, but really for Courtney's baby. Um, but anyway, I hope you all have a, a great week. I will tell you that um, Laura and I are running a program in June. It's um, four Tuesdays in June. It's called Degrees of Impact. It's going to give everybody lots of space to think about programming and particular attention in how to repurpose what we are talking about to make it work for next year. So if that is of interest, all the information is in an, every email I send you and then also um, on our website. And um, Susan is offering, and I'm going to say it on behalf of Sarah as well, if you want to reach out to either of them, I will share their contact information. Thank you all so much. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I appreciate this community more than you will know. So thank you. Reach out if you need anything, please. Thank you.